Uh, now let's open for some questions. Uh, could you please identify yourself? There's a microphone in the middle. Or otherwise you can just uh, yell to us, raise your, your voice. Yes, please. I'm going to try and yell. Paul Carlson from the Syngenta Foundation. I've got a question about the Brazilian model. Uh, also, the, uh, is, could, is that really making a difference to child nutrition? And the agricultural innovation, well, it may be making a, a change to child nutrition in China by exporting, but what evidence is there that it's really making a difference in Brazil? Mm -hmm. If you could put those two in some kind of relation of perspective in relation to the topic, that would be great. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, here's one. Uh, Mark Westgate, Iowa State University, again for, for the Brazil uh, presentation. You mentioned a human development index. Can you describe that, please? Okay, let's have another one. <coughs> Around Brazil. Beatrice, maybe you can go ahead and chew it. Okay. Well, as, as long as exportations are concerned, Brazil has been uh, keeping 70% of the, the, the overall uh, cultural products in the country. That was that your question, as compared to China? No, no, I was uh, asking how agricultural innovation in Brazil was making a difference to child nutrition, and how you put that in relationship to the whole uh, Okay, well, the links are not that clear, of course. But in a sense, I would say that uh, uh, when we have enough food uh, and the food, uh, the, the, uh, the price of the food is low, the parents have uh, access to it freely. Uh, not freely, but in, uh, have better access to food. Uh, on the other hand, there were also many other uh, governmental actions related to child nutrition, including uh, um, mother, mother education, uh, as a, uh, a continuous assistance and monitoring, and especially, I would say that the population has been gaining more and more uh, uh, knowledge of the good, good nutrition and the way they should treat children. Uh, for instance, there are many initial, any civil organization initiatives, including the pastoral, uh, uh, that was the Christian, uh, well, Churches, which were together and uh, trying to teach mothers how to raise their children and how to put the food, the right combination of the food. And there is also a partnership between various ministries uh, which are uh, um, putting those things into discussion and making people more aware of the value, uh, nutrition value of food and also helping mothers to raise their children, including uh, breastfeeding. That's uh, a national campaign for that. The other one. Thank you. Uh, David Lambert, Iowa State. Could you comment on the, uh, the Lancet study, was it three years ago, and to what extent it's, it has currency today, and whether its findings are consistent with your findings? Um, yes, uh, the, the Lancet series was published in 2008, in, in January and February 2008, um, and um, it, it is very important in terms of making the point very clearly with reviewing the empirical evidence uh, about the focus on the other two. So we had been uh, different studies had been done over time that were showing the importance of, of focusing on, on the young children. We started with saying, oh, it should be the children under three from a study in Guatemala, and then we lowered it to under two. And, and so the Lancet was an excellent review and, and providing all the scientific evidence we needed to move forward with that. Uh, there, is still, there are still some lots of delays in implementation. Uh, it's amazing how long it takes for the science to get into the practice. So we're saying that, we've been saying that for years, 
The Lancet series is for academics. People have seen it. There's been a lot of publicity around it, but still the academics are, are, are convinced, but the, the program uh, implementers are, are, are taking a lot longer. So we hope that with the Thousand Day Initiative of, of the um, government of the US with, with Ireland, as well as the Global Hunger Index will we'll bring in the advocacy and, and reach the policymakers and people that are able to make the decisions about this focus. Carlos? Yeah. I think it's a reflection just following up on, on this last point. It strikes me that sort of the whole area of the effectiveness of social marketing, of changing attitudes and behavior seems essential in India, in Brazil, in all these places. I think we as an ag community have really neglected that a lot. And I think it's something where we may learn from the health people. Yep. Why don't you come to uh, the microphone? Hi, I'm Maria Kasparian from Indicia uh, Global Nutrition Solutions. And um, we, one of the things we work with is ready to use therapeutic <coughs> and supplementary foods. <coughs> Um, and increasingly looking at kind of lipid-based supplements for prevention as well, both for mothers during pregnancy and lactation, and then during for children six to 24 months. So I'm wondering if you could speak to lipid-based supplements and things that, or other kinds of supplements as part of, kind of a package. Yes, um, we work on these things too. Um, basically, we need to get uh, children to receive enough micronutrients. We've, we've realized that yes, there is a problem of young children not getting <coughs> enough food, but the biggest problem is that they don't get the right types of food. Uh, for a young child that has very high requirements in essential micronutrients and a very small stomach, it's, it takes a very concentrated kind of food for them to get everything they need. That's why in the US and in developed countries we we have uh, cereals that are fortified. Everything is fortified. Everything you give to young, young infants is fortified. Um, in developing countries, we don't have that luxury. Fortified products do exist in some places. They are not accessible for the poor. Uh, so we're trying to, to find other solutions, other ways of getting these micronutrients into young children. Uh, there's been a new wave of, of products that are better used or, or that mothers prefer compared to the pills or um, the liquids that were that were the previous generation of micronutrient supplements. So now we have micronutrient powders, which you can sprinkle, uh, we call them sprinkles, you can sprinkle them on the food, and so they are part of the diet, and they are very effective at, at reducing micronutrient deficiencies. And what you're talking about are lipid-based supplements. So they're, they're also micronutrients that are in a, in, a, in a base that contains fat, and which we assume is, is better absorbed. So there is definitely a role for these products uh, we don't want them to be the magic bullet. We don't want them to replace food. They have to go with food. They have to be part of the diet, and people need to be educated on how to use them and complement the diet of them. Okay, last question. Thanks. So I appreciate uh, Robert Mazur from Iowa State University. I appreciate the emphasis on the first thousand days, but we know that the first five years are also very important. So as you get this message out, Maybe in the past it's been too hard for organizations to kind of come to grips with focusing on the first five years, but how do you get this message across while also giving due attention to the post-weaning period, which is often seen as very vulnerable as well? Thanks. I will just answer very quickly. It's important. <laughs> Actually, uh, this, this is an issue, and what is most important for the two to five is not so much nutrition anymore, it's development. So we need to find a way to combine the nutrition during the first thousand days and the development during the two to five. Well, thank you. Thank you, the, the three prominent speakers, for such exciting uh, presentations. But it's clear that we have made a program becoming hunger. As you can see, the global hunger index has come down from 20% in 1990 to about 15% today. The Millennium Development Goal is to cut the hunger by half. So I don't think we are on track yet. And more important than there is such a large regional variation. South Asia has made, has, has made very little progress in that. And obviously, um, there are many success stories, China, Vietnam, and Brazil. And agriculture plays a very critical role there, particularly in the case of Brazil, 
the increased production really drove down the food prices. So food is much cheaper than before. So the normal citizen in Brazil, I have never heard about lack of money to buy food, or some, some do, but the government use social protection to make sure they have access. And for India, I think Dr. Swaminathan made a very powerful uh, speech here. So he is a hero, he is a fighter against hunger and poverty, not only in India, but also at a global level. As you may remember, he was the Director General of IRI. So the IR8, IR36 really increased food accessibility in many, or availability in many Asian countries. I think without the IRI's contribution, so we would have seen much more poverty or hunger uh, in, in Asia. And in India, yes indeed, the malnutrition rate is, is very high, particularly for children. So it, the Indian Prime Minister called it a national shame or national curse. I think Srimanathan is really arguing for a very comprehensive approach for tackling that problem. So agricultural growth, yes, very inclusive growth, but in the meantime, targeting the poor, make sure access to food is a right, so they, which I, I, I like the very much. So access to food is a basic human <coughs> right. We need to make sure everybody, every citizen, citizen in this planet has access to food. So for that, IPRI is very much um, in line with you. And so we can work together to make sure that the shining India, shining India's growth will, will translate to a reduction in malnutrition. And we will come back every year, so the, we will treat this as an annual event, release our Global Hunger Index. So we welcome your comments, your feedback, so we can really improve. Uh, once again, uh, thank you very much. Thank you for coming back. Coming to the